Your harmy hearties. Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Picking up where we left off last time with Total War Warhammer 2 in the Count Noctilus Mortal Empires campaign. If you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and join the crew of the Bloody Reaver. Or, if you've already turned yourself into an undead monstrosity and join the crew to help man the mainsails and the cannons, then go on down, hit the like button, and share the video far and wide across the seas of the Warhammer world. And remember, if you go on down to leave comments down below, you can rename any of these fabulous units. In fact, we've already renamed some, like the Sword and Board Gang or the Plank Walking Pistoliers. We will not, however, rename Jim the Stasher because hashtag I crawl with Jim. But now, let's kick things off and beat the snot out of Ashok the Bloody and send him and his crew down to the cold, watery depths. And today we are also going to try to talk about the early history of the High Elves of the Warhammer world. Now, the High Elves at this time, they were in an unparalleled age of exploration and discovery, and they were one of the races that the Old Ones had decreed was going to fit within their great plan. Or at least we can infer this, because Lord Croak, who had learned the arts of magic from Lord Tepok, the Old One, uh, one of the Old Ones, uh, he taught them, he, Lord Croak taught the High Elves, their ancestors, these same arts. So if he's teaching them these things, then they must have had a place within the Great Plan. What that was, no one can say, for all the Old Ones are gone, and those Slan Mage Priests of the First Spawning have all died. But... In any case, we know that the High Ones must have had some, or High Elves must have had some role to play, and they hailed out from the islands of Ulthuan and wandered the depth and breadth of the Warhammer world, exploring everything that the uh, that the Old Ones and the Lizardmen had created. And in doing so, they discovered so many great and wondrous things and terrible things. They bore witness to the creation of new races and the annihilation of those that the Old Ones had decided did not fit, did not have a place within their plan. Now, none was so well-traveled or as much of a mighty warrior as uh, Anarian. A Narian of the High Elves was a singular being. He was a warrior in an age of unparalleled peace. And he was able to explore further and farther and fight through many more prehistoric, ancient, nigh-on eldritch horrors that uh, just could not be conceived of, at least until the collapse of the Polar Gates had happened. And this was one such legendary figure. But then you also had Astariel, the Ever Queen. Uh, beloved of Isha. Isha was the wife of Asurian, the chief patron deity of the High Elven Pantheon. And Isha, like I said, was his queen. And so long as the Ever Queen exists, the heart of the High Elves will never, ever go out. That flame will never sputter, never gutter, never waver. So, these are centrally important figures to, uh, to High Elven history, both early and current. Then you also had another figure, Kalidor Dragon Tamer, got his name because he actually was able to befriend, befriend and tame the ancient dragons, some, uh, one of the few species that the High Elves had to contend with at the time, and with that friendship brought an unparalleled level of power and prestige to the, uh, to the High Elves. And so with all this in play, with these kinds of figures uh, of, uh, involved in the early High Elven history, Things went incredibly well for them, for their people, as they explored and traveled. And Kalidor Dragon Tamer was not just a dragon tamer but he, uh, and rider, but he was also the singularly greatest wizard of the age of his people. The only ones that could really match or contend with them would have been the old ones, uh, not the old ones themselves, but the Slan Mage Priests, the old ones. Who could really contend with the old ones, honestly? But that's the level of power that they enjoyed. 
And all of this went well for them. I mean, it was to the point that the High Elves actually managed to make contact with the ancient forest spirits. Forest spirits who, who traveled the roots of the world tree to also travel all across the globe to ex explore the worlds in all of their splendor. Uh, in modes of travel that could only be possibly matched by... Uh, uh, by the old ones themselves, honestly. So, again, incredible amounts of power to be wielded here, to be used, and... Uh, bleh, I'm coming up with all sorts of words as I try to make sure that I'm fighting this properly here. It might be an easy victory, but it's still a victory in which I don't want to just needlessly waste these units. And I want to make sure my artillery is properly protected as well. Okay. So yeah, things were going great for the High Elves to like, an incredibly unparalleled degree. Things were impossibly good for them, and things did not go awry or fall apart until the collapse of the Great Polar Gates happened, in which the forces of chaos flooded through the world and magic seeped in uncontrollable waves into the fabric of reality itself. Like I said last time, this is when the earth quaked and shook, mountain ranges rose up, continents cracked apart. Everything the old ones had been setting about was annihilated in an instant, or for irrevo irrevocably, unstoppably changed. Decisive victory. All right. I mean, new horrible creations came about. You had the Beastmen. You had uh, the early men corrupted by the forces of chaos. You had demons, greater demons from all four of the chaos deities, flooding through the world, slaughtering all that they came across. And it was in this moment that uh, Anarian led his people to their first early victories over the forces of chaos, fighting his way through, fighting his way uh, to the shrine of, not Assyrian, well, he first fought his way through, the, through to the shrine of Assyrian, where he prayed to the flames of the great god, promising to sacrifice anything he could in order to turn the fortunes of his people, even his own self. So, keeping true to his word, a Sir, uh, Anarian threw himself into the fire, but instead of being consumed and dying from those glorious go uh, godly flames, uh, he was remade. He was remade and reborn as the Phoenix King and was given incredible near godlike powers. He essentially was a demigod walking the face of the Warhammer world. And he strode outside the temple of, uh, of Asurian, grabbed a spear and hurled it, slaying a greater demon and annihilating it in a single throw. And with that, with that demon gone, the magic energies it was vomiting forth to sustain its army dissipated with it and to the, with this he was able to lead the high elves to greater and greater victories and managed to secure Ulthman to a slightly greater degree and ensure his people's safety built fortresses all along the northern ends of Ulthman up here around Tor Anlak or the Shrine of Cain all of these places became great incredible fortifications where the forces of chaos stormed down from the north. Even along here, he built other fortifications to help ensure the High Elves and that Ulthuan would remain safe. But it would end up not really being enough. And, the, and uh, to help aid in all of this, um, Kalidor Dragon Tamer also swore fealty to the Phoenix King and brought not only his incredible magical arts, but the forces of great flights of dragons and dragon riders to bear against the forces of chaos. This is truly an incredible, astounding amount of firepower and combat ability just laying, laying about everything, annihilating army after army. And still, it ended up not being enough. 
Let's see here. What do I want to throw in? Let's do Curse of Undeath. Just to help out with more of that regeneration. Want to advance this along a little bit more too. Okay. Oop. Jim the Stasher. Good. Let's see. What can we level up for you, buddy? Let's go with Devastating Charge. Greater charge bonus is not going to hurt things. Oh, we still have some forces to rip apart here. Let's do it. And we'll... Uh, mm, yeah, we'll auto-resolve. That's replaceable. And we shall heal up a little bit more. Achieve victory over rogue armies multiple times. Viper Killer. Loyalty is an unknown concept to some. Such treachery always finds its punishment in due course. Plus five when fighting against rogue armies. Nice. Boys of the Forbidden Coast are sent to the inky depths. Let's get out of the reef just to be safe. Level up Jim again. As we'll have other things that we can throw in here. Look, ooh, scavenge would probably be... I don't know why I haven't been doing scavenge. Increasing the post-battle loot would be a wonderful thing to have. Unassigned skill points for more. Aid McMaggot. Aid, you've really been disappointing me lately. Let's give you Lucky Charm then. Steel Technology. Success. All right. Slightly redeemed, my friend. Oops. All right. We've given them something to think about there with the Empire. So let's get ourselves back into the fort to recover a little bit. And then we'll try... Ooh, good. Icket Claw causing some trouble for Bretonia. Definitely a plus. Hey, hey. What are you doing? Get back up here. Good. And Connor nods. What ideally what we can do here is after we get recovered a little bit, even one turn's gonna do a lot for us. Concentration of force, something Napoleon did and was very good at, was concentrating his forces. He would think let his opponents think that his forces were spread in one location and uh, would leave some troops behind and make it look like he still had the same number of troops there the night before, but then march a couple of divisions or extra squads, brigades, battalions, of those things, and concentrate his forces into one location where the enemy was still spread out over multiple areas. And then he could weaken them, taking out one section, and then hopefully hit another before the others realized what was happening, and then really crash down on them and con and like... Uh, if he could take out one or two positions, uh, one or two of their broken up army pieces, then he could mop up the rest with his overwhelming advantage in numbers at that point, even if he started out at a point of, with a disadvantage in numbers. Definitely an impressive move. And that's what we're going to try to do here against the dwarves before the dwarves really have a chance to build back up again. We'll still build our forces or try to let's see hmm armor piercing missiles would be good 245 range it outrange all of these guys 90 range anti-large armor piercing missiles I don't have any large to worry about yet but some better range would be good and breaking armor is definitely a plus so let's throw these guys in it'll be more of a hit to our income but that's okay okay they're doing that hero not moved
I really want to see what's going on over here. I know the vampire counts are moving in. Let's see what exactly is happening. How bad is it? Ubersreich is here, and Ubersreich is built up really good. It's got walls. Barracks, Taylor's Guild. That's actually not a bad settlement at all. Okay. Let's see. Is there anybody I'm missing? Tim! Tim, you slimy dog. And Len. Len the Brine. Okay. Ah, so much of this map. Ooh, that's probably Skaven. Honestly, looking at all this... This is definitely territory belonging to Clan Moore, so... Queek Headtaker. That's terrifying to think of. Furon Wavemaker. I have to kill him. I have, to have a lot of pirates to kill on here. Alright, well... At any rate, let's end the turn and begin collecting these islands and wrecks. See what kind of loot we can garner from these. Hmm, let's see. Ooh. Casualty replenishment or sea legs. A plan of action. The night sky bleeds purple. The wind of Shaiish is strong, instilling the crew with newfound vigor and strength. Now is the time for action, for conquest, and for using this magical boon to our advantage. Should we control the seas, or turn our attention to new lands? <laughs> okay. Given that we are focusing a lot on combat, we are going to go with Landlubber. The time's come to make port and build ourselves an empire, conquering new cities and pillaging towns as we go. No hazard shall slow our advance. Hostile wounding failure. And Nagaron performed the sacrifice to Mathlan. They have one of those island ships going now. Let's go to the Skull Reef. <laughs> We are going to raid the cove. I forgot to replace a thing. That's okay. Ooh. You know what? Let's do it. Let's fight it. Annie Lowe. Well, Annie, here's to you. Hmm. I've completely spaced on doing history things for the High Elves, but... Yeah, you can kind of get a picture of the epic struggles. And I use that word in its original sense. Not just the general, like, oh, dude, epic. But just the epic scope of the fighting. I mean, magic is flooding the world. The raw chaos energies of the warp is just flooding in. And wizards like Kalidor T Dragon Tamer, leading hosts of other arc a high elven arc mages are utilizing these energies, conjuring vast and powerful spells from atop Dragonback to utterly burn out swathes and armies, just scything through. And then you have Anarian, the Phoenix King, the first Phoenix King, raining down with his own dragon, wielding mighty weapons, a literal demigod walking the earth, while Astariel, the Ever Queen, is using her powers to embolden, to strengthen, and to heal the High Elven peoples, to keep the lands intact, using her connections with the forest spirits in order to bring them to their side and aid, to uh, utterly annihilate the forces of chaos and keep the world defended and alive. And then, you know, we haven't even touched on the, the dwarves and the ancestor gods and all the fighting that they're doing alongside the lizard men and the slan mage priests. Just epic scope of global combat as these forces of chaos come flooding down from the north. Absolutely incredible and an act, absolutely great story, as far as I'm concerned, anyways. Just really, really good stuff. 
And you can see why I'm fascinated with this lore, with this history, and why I think it's a worthwhile thing to read up on. And I've used it to help inform a lot of my own gaming, a lot of my own games, and getting things going for my players in unique and interesting directions. I mean, hell, I really like the idea of making it so that my players think they're playing a normal D&D game on some f lost, far-flung fantasy world, and then all of a sudden breaking out Warhammer 40k miniatures, and they go, oh no, what's happening here? It certainly sounds like a very fun idea. Yeah, I, I saw that meme on uh, Facebook somewhere at some point. Thought it was a great idea. Still think it's a great idea. We're going to let them come to us. We are going to rip them to shreds in the, in the meantime. Let's see what happens here. Ooh. Not a bad target, but why don't you shoot the rotting leviathan? So they've redirected, so you guys... Those depth guard alive. Fight! Get her! Oh, 
anything. I don't think I did. Bottoms up, by the way. Mm, that went well. Whew, 158 kills. I really need to recruit another Necrofex or two. Probably not be a bad replacement for that uh, bloated corpse, actually. So one more Necrofex. So, yeah, the Tides of Chaos were just this terrible, pervasive thing. But with Anarian's leadership and the uniting with uh, Kalidor Dragon Tamer, Astariel the Ever Queen, and their marriage together, and the fact that they had children, really cemented down Anarian's legitimacy, on top of the fact that he was just an incredible war hero in general, too. And, again, living demigod, clearly, apparently chosen by... Uh, by their chief deity, Asurian. All these things came together to really secure things for the High Elves, but it was a stability that wasn't going to last during a particularly fierce storm of chaos as the f their forces came rolling down they actually managed to pierce their way deep within the island of Ulthwan, and they actually managed to slaughter their way through to the realm of Astariel. Now, Astariel was fighting side by side with these, uh, uh, with the ancient tree and forest spirits, and she begged Durthu to help save her children, her two young children. She didn't want them to die at the hands of the demons. Master and Commander, I'd rather have the crew three sheets to the wind than face a mutiny. Lads, it's grog o'clock! Achieve victory in multiple naval battles, plus 8 no melee attack when fighting at sea, plus 12 leadership when fighting at sea, and we got 20,000 and a berserker sword. That's great. Wow. I wonder if I can throw that on Jim. I should be able to. But yeah, so... They... Uh, she pressured and pressed Durthu into into saving her children, uh, taking them through the roots of the world tree back to his realm, back to the ancient forest that he was from, which is over here, to the King's Glade in this area here. I forget the name of the forest right off the top of my head, but Durthu was hesitant to do so. It was, this wasn't a path for mortal beings to tread. None, none had ever done it before, but he believed it was possible, and he didn't know how his fellow... Uh, tree spirits or any of the other spirits would react to having mortal creatures brought through the roots of the world tree and into the very depths and heart of their realm. But finally, as the demons began closing in, as I believe it was in Kari, the greatest of the servants of the chaos god Slanesh, the prince of pleasure, she who thirsts, he finally agreed and spirited away the children of Astariel. And Astariel turned and faced down the greater demon with the last of her power in a ferocious battle that still ultimately saw her slaughtered by his vile claws. But her children were saved and preserved. Unfortunately, though, that's not the news that Anarian received. All he knew was that his family was dead that they had been slaughtered and taken from him. And with this, he fell into a deep malaise, a horrific depression. And understandably so. His wife, his beloved wife was gone. His children were gone. What else was left for him? God, the Dark Elves are really pressing in here. I'm gonna have to go to war with them. Try to keep the High Elves alive so that way they keep fighting each other. Okay. So... Um... So he fell into this deep, blackened state. Just his heart had crumbled and been ripped away from him. And so uh, 
he began losing himself to combat, losing himself to madness, and he actually found some comfort, some res respite within the arms of Marathi. Eh, that same Marathi who is actually just over here. Over here leading these Dark Can't Elven forces. Sorcery. She married Anarian. She was his second wife. And sh they had their son together. Uh, gosh, now I'm spacing on his name. Let's see. He should be just right here. Yes. Malekith, this whiny little spoiled brat. He, they had Malekith together in this time of darkness. And because he felt he had nothing left to live for, Anarian went to the Shrine of Cain and drew the Sword of Cain, Widowmaker, a blade that sends its user into the depths of bloodlust and madness, just utterly lost to the whims of murderous fate. And he lost himself in his lust, in his bloodlust. He lost everything that he was. And he did so willingly. And he did so willingly within the arms of Marathi. And he found some measure of comfort in that. And so... Did things progress. And he... Uh, Anarian began to not really care as to what state the world was going to be in then. He just wanted to burn and destroy all of... As much of chaos as he could to try to preserve his people and his... The High Elves following him went willingly into this darkness, into this madness with their king. I mean, how could they not? It was their king. And he had done so much to help them and to preserve them. And again, his king. So they followed him and they became just as dark as he did. And they became just as blackened and spiteful and vengeful and hateful as he was. It got to the point that things were spiraling so badly that the High Elves were being pushed back so far that Kalidor finally pressed his plans and his ideas to Anarion. And he finally said, I'm going to conjure the Great Vortex. Me and the greatest of my Archmages are going to enact this ritual. They were worried that trying to control such vast quantities of magical energies would annihilate the world, but the High Elves, the High Elven Wizard, had discovered the geomantic web that had crisscrossed across the world, and they erected several runestones all along these geomantic nexus points, and were using that to help stabilize their ritual in order to conjure the Great Vortex. Uh, Anarian still thought it was a fool's errand to even try, but... Kalidor said regardless he was going to do it and things would be much more like they would be much more likely to succeed if Anarian were to bring what forces he could to help but initially he refused after talking with Marathi Marathi you know urged him to not do it urged him to not go because for all of her darkness all of her through all of her faults she did love Anarian she, she was smitten and taken with him he was probably the only thing that she, the only person she had ever really truly loved, and she was a legendary beauty amongst the High Elves, uh, one that had even rivaled Astariel, the Ever Chosen, a being literally picked out to be the living avatar of a deity. But, you know, he opted to leave. He took what forces that could make their way to the island where the Great Vortex was going to be conjured. And he instructed his remaining forces to descend to defend his wife and son and be loyal to his son to the last. An oath which they took and still hold to to this day in many cases. And so Anarian set off to help defend Kalidor Dragon Tamer as they conjured the Great Vortex. Ooh. Okay. Hostile hero activity. They assaulted the garrison at Fort Bergbris. Mission issued. Be at war with the Von Karsteins. Of course I can do that. Ooh, that's a great bonus. Dire tidings from the north. The tendrils of chaos writhe and reach out from the accursed wastes, tainting the land and sowing dissent. Their corrupt forces wax ever stronger, and now their agents are abroad, spreading the foul corruption of their malign gods. On their heels come bands of marauding warriors, led by the most zealous of the Chaos Lords, eager to wreak destruction in the name of the ruinous powers. 
and all the while, ever more warriors flock to some focal point in the chaos wastes, a nexus of power which transcends their petty rivalries and impels them to join with the numberless horde. Doom approaches, and it is only in strength that any hope may be found. Here we go. The Winds of Pain, <laughs> plus 20 magic to all armies. And Alberic de Bordolo is bearing down. There's probably another army over here that went into, uh, into ambush stance. But we've got a significantly improved defense here, although that has been weakened somewhat with the garrison being assaulted. So, much as I wanted to go after the dwarves here, we are going to send Estelle Gordy. Let's see. Yeah, you're going to need to force march it back. We're going to force march back here to deal with Alberic and whatever other armies may be coming because that, that's not all of them. Not by a long shot. No, see. Although Knights of the Realm, those are dangerous and they're supported by a Grail Reliquary. Knights Errant, Pegasus Knights, those are the big one. And Albrick, Albrick himself is terrifying. They also drove off Wolfric the Wanderer here, so that's a thing. Ooh, and he's got the Trident of Manan, the Bride of Bordolo. Let's see, they're probably either in an ambush, or maybe not. I am a rune lord. You know what? Let's try attacking here. No, he ran. A valiant defeat, you say? Oh, we are trying this. So, I may resume that history later, because I think after this fight, this is where we are probably going to call it. But, we'll see. We'll end the turn and see if they actually end up attacking at Fort Bergbris. Oh, it's, it's out in the open field. Hmm, that might actually be problematic. But... I'm willing to bet our overwhelming firepower and our explosive troops will help to make make up for several, several of our deficiencies, especially if we can clear out their ranged units and some of these heavier hitting longbeard units. Those longbeards are terrifying. There's no doubt about that. I'm attacking them though, so they may well start off on the defensive, so let's move ourselves over here okay honey <laughs>Looks like I was right about this being the last bit for me here. I'm back, and joining me now is my most adorable co-host, Atticus. We are going to try to wrap this battle up in as quick a fashion as possible, but who knows what will happen over the course of battle. Alright, so I've got this rock here to anchor things a little bit. Let's get a long fire going. Let's see, let's put you guys right there. Put these in the middle. All of you turn off your instincts to run. You son. Spilled a bit, huh? You okay? Okay. Have him right there in the middle to support as well. And then 
Let's get this going. See what happens. Till they get a bit closer to us. It's a great start so far. got some healing to make use of as well. Which will be useful for us. Just one oh, second oh, here. Oh. Hello, Atticus. <laughs> oh, these small children. <laughs> so many gray hairs. Man, they make life so much more interesting. Alright, you little stinker. What's that? Say this is going swimmingly well. Oh, Atticus, small son, my rebellious child. Please stop. I know you're upset, son, but that's no reason to. Oh, yes, that would be the F bomb. Oh goodness, you sneak. No, no. No, no, buddy. I know, but no, no. Oh, 
And with that, we have secured victory. We could have been using this to increase our attack rate, but eh. We're going to end the battle there on a close victory, going up from a valiant defeat, which I call that a win. Oh my goodness, I have so many books to reset now. One and a half year olds, ladies and gentlemen, one and a half year olds. This is why I respect the fact that some people just don't want kids. I did. My wife did. Yeah. I still do. And yeah. I love them. Yeah. But it is messy. Uh-oh. Though it was really cute. They were trying to help me clean yesterday. They'd spilled a bunch of cleaner on the floor. And so they'd grabbed rags. They'd grabbed rags and started scrubbing. Which was just adorable. But of course I helped them. And don't worry, it was non-toxic cleaners. Nothing that could make them sick. Just wouldn't taste the best. Ooh. No, no. No, no, buddy. Good job. Hey. Ta-da! Ta -da. Hooray! Go clap, clap, clap. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh. See? Those ranged units were some of their most dangerous. Now, these would have been much worse if they'd been allowed to get closer, but their ranged units still Ta had... Ta-da! Ta -da. Biggest capability of doing a lot of damage. Oh my goodness. That. That. My small chaos baby, ladies and gentlemen. Ta-da! Ta -da. Good job, you closed it. Okay, not bad at all. And we could sack it, but we are going to occupy it. Yeah, what is that, huh? That. Hmm. Let's raise another unit of shooters. Cheap and inexpensive. All right, and right there, we are going to call it good and save. If you are new here to the channel, remember, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. Or, if you've already gone on ahead and done that, go on down, hit the like button, share the video across the high seas of the Warhammer world, and leave comments to rename any of the units and any of the armies, and we will go ahead and see you next time. But with all that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time, and you all have yourselves a good night.